I'm Nicolas Bornois of Capital Inc. And uh, I would like to thank all of you for being with us today and making this uh, two-day conference a great uh, success. We are now at the last, but certainly not the least, of the sessions of the day of the forum. Uh, we are going to conclude our forum with a very high power panel of uh, six high profile CEOs uh, representing different uh, sectors of the industry, containers, tankers, dry bulk. So uh, without uh, any more uh, delay, I would, I would like to welcome uh, the, our panelists. I would like to thank uh, Henry for uh, uh, moderating this panel. Actually, before coming on board, we were just discussing how global this is, because we have uh, uh, Bing and, and Hing in uh, Hong Kong. We have Kevin in Singapore, Henry in uh, London, uh, Lois, uh, Gary, uh, and myself, we are New York and, uh, and, connect and uh, Stanford, and uh, Jerry is in Athens. So that's a truly global panel. Uh, I think uh, it shows the globality of the industry and also the connectivity that we have today. So thank you to everybody. Uh, Henry, you can take over. And as a reminder, after the session is over, please join us, if you would like, to the uh, Capital Link um, uh, chat room, the networking lounge for Q&A and for networking. And again, thank you very much to all of you. And now I will disappear and let the panel uh, continue. Nicholas, thank you very much. Um, so as Nicholas says, uh, good uh, afternoon from London. Um, this is uh, the last session of, uh, of certainly Nicholas's day. Uh, and as Nicholas says, we've, we've got a great, uh, a great panel of, uh, of CEOs to discuss the burning issues of the day. Um, I think we represent much more than just containers, dry bulk and tankers in our totality. I think uh, between, uh, between all of you, pretty much every, every market has been covered at least uh, by some point, at some point. Um, what um, I'm looking forward to certainly is being able to see how a lot of the issues that we're facing today are viewed through the prism of the different sectors. And it's quite unusual to have this many people from different sectors to be able to comment on, on, on what's happening. And obviously we're tackling this at a very interesting time um, where in theory demand should be very weak, but obviously some sectors are performing quite well. Tankers has done very well. Dry bulk seems to be picking up. Um, so, you know, it'd be a very interesting opportunity to discuss um, how this lockdown, this, uh, these efforts to contain um, COVID-19 are impacting demand and are we seeing early signs of recovery? So I'll just very briefly um, run you through uh, who we've got on this, on this panel. Um, uh, and then perhaps I'll ask each of, each of our panelists, um, if only to test the microphones, just to give a little introduction to their companies and what sectors uh, they are focusing on and perhaps a little uh, uh, clue as to why that's the focus. So from the container sector, or certainly uh, representing containers today, uh, we've got uh, Bing Chen, CEO of uh, Atlas Core, um, and Jerry Kalagaratos, CEO of Capital Product Partners. Um, on the dry side, uh, Hing Xiao, who's Executive Director of Hua Kong Maritime Transport Holdings, and Gary Vogel, CEO of Eagle Bulk, and then on the tanker side, Kevin McKay, from C for CEO of TK Tankers, and uh, Lois Dabrowski, CEO of International Seaways. Lois, why don't you just uh, start us off? Just give us a little introduction to International Seaways and what your sector focus is. Yeah, thank you very much, Henry. So uh, we have uh, 37 vessels at International Seaways. The majority of our vessels are uh, tankers and we're diversified. Everything from Vs down to MR. And uh, we, we do like the diversification. You know, you frequently, uh, even as presently in the tanker market, see a uh, differential on different classes. And, and, and at the moment, the bigger ships have held up better than the smaller ships. And Kevin? Yeah, TK is, uh, has a rich history in the tanker space. Uh, our origins go back about 47 years. And we've been a stalwart of, of the modern tanker era. Um, we grew out of the TK company as the, the conventional tanker arm, if you will, of the group. Um, and we're focused primarily on the mid-sized tanker space. So Suez Maxes, Aframax, and LR2s. Uh, we do also have a 50% stake in a VLCC, 
with our good friends on the panel, Wakwong Maritime. Um, and today we currently have a fleet of 53 tankers plus another 23 to 24 that we've taken on time charter and through our very competitive pool business. Um, we also take part in the full service light rich trade in the US Gulf, which really maximizes our sort of core business around the Aframax and the Suezmax space. Um, and, uh, you know, as you've, you've all seen, the growth in US exports um, is something that we've been really able to take advantage of because of our specialization in sort of that mid sized tanker space. And uh, Hing Xiao, you, you've uh, obviously covered a lot of sectors uh, as a company in your time. At the moment, you're predominantly dry dock, is that right? At the moment, yes. Um, Wakon, historically, we are fairly sector agnostic. So we have been anything from general cargo ships to containers, dry bulk carriers, gas carriers, um, tankers, of course, product tanker, etc. At this moment in time, um, our modern diversified fleet are basically focused on dry bulk carriers and crude oil tankers. Um, on the tanker side, it's relatively straightforward. We have four Aframaxes, two VLCCs, and two more on order. So it's pretty straightforward. On the dry bulk side, we are, uh, our position is much more complicated. We cover basically the whole range from Handy through from Handy Max, Super Max, Ultra Max, Panamax, Post Panamax. Camps Max all the way up to Cape. And at this moment in time, I would say Wakong, it's in a moment of transition and of consolidation. On the dry bulk side, um, the area of growth for us is mainly in the middle sector. So by end of next year, we're looking to consolidate our position in uh, supra to ultra category so that we'll build up uh, a position of a uh, nice small fleet of about 20 ships, mainly in ultra, so about 15 ultras by end of uh, 2020. Thank you, thank you. Um, Gary, you're a mid, mid sector, mid sector bulk carrier, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Eagle Bulk, uh, our headquarters is Stamford, Connecticut. As, as Nicholas said, we own 50 uh, vessels in the Supermax, Ultramax, 20 or Ultramax is obviously 30, 30 Supermaxes. Plus, we supplement that on it with a charter and fleet. So we have an active management you know, focus on dynamically uh, um, operating our, our vessels. Uh, we also have 41 of our 50 vessels are scrubber fitted as well and uh, offices in Singapore and in Copenhagen, you know, on the commercial side. Lovely, lovely. Uh, and Jerry, very briefly, I, I know you've sort of uh, come at various hats on to these conferences. Today, your containers, is that right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's right, Henry. So, um, Capital Product Partners today owns uh, 14 uh, post Panamax. Uh, uh, container uh, vessels, actually 13 post Panama container vessels and one dry bulk vessel. Um, the company, uh, is, uh, is, if you want uh, a spin off uh, from Capital Maritime that uh, IPO'd back in 2007 with a number of tankers. Over time, uh, we have uh, uh, split uh, the tanker exposure and now we are only in containers. Um, we are, I, I would say, I would also like the word agnostic. We are agnostic about uh, vessel types, but we do like uh, cast flows. Uh, so uh, container ships uh, offer more of that opportunity, that is uh, cast flow visibility. But uh, when you look at the wider uh, uh, group, uh, Capital today controls uh, just sort of 90 ships across uh, crude tankers, product tankers, containers, dry bulk, as well as LNG. So I, I might be drawing from that experience as well as uh, we go into some of the, the topics. Wonderful, wonderful. And, uh, and finally, Bing, Bing Chen, uh, your uh, ex, uh, ex C span, isn't it, Atlas? Yeah, that's correct. So, um, yeah, we, we're, the C span actually went through a uh, reorganization uh, this February to, uh, to, to formulate a holding company called Atlas. Atlas, a, Atlas is a holding company currently holding uh, two fully owned subsidiary. One is which is in the maritime, and the other is a uh, company called APR, which is in the uh, energy business. Uh, for today's purpose, uh, C-SPAN is uh, in an in a, in a owner-operator space, in a container ship um, owner-operating space. Uh, we own currently 123 vessels, 
with a total capacity of uh, over 1.1 1, 1, 1 million TEU. Um, our fleet uh, largely uh, with over 70% of our fleet is uh, you know, with those uh, uh, container vessels is greater than uh, 9,000 TEU. Um, our business model on a, in a container shipping space is more of a long term. Uh, about 95% of my uh, revenue is on a long term charter. So therefore only 5% is on the spot. And uh, our fleet in general rather, you know, large size and uh, younger, uh, average age about uh, seven years. And we have, uh, you know, contracted revenue over uh, 4.6 years. So that's, um, that's, that's um, you know, the, the C-SPAN business. And APR business is less relevant, but that's, uh, you know, leading fast power um, uh, business where we do um, provide the turnkey solution to uh, provide the fast power. Okay, so, so suffice it to say that of us, um, we can speak with a certain degree of authority on behalf of the main uh, bulk shipping sectors. So let's, let's start off um, just addressing <clears throat> this extraordinary transformation of demand that's happened over the last three or four months as a result of uh, COVID. Um, and I guess, you know, the best person to start this off or the best people to start with this off would be those with a an eye on the container sector, really, because they're the most macro focused and the most directly influenced by sort of, you know, global economy. Um, so, so perhaps, uh, Jerry, perhaps you could start us off just uh, giving us a little uh, feel for, for how your market's developed over the last few months. And are there early signs now of, of recovery taking place as people come out of lockdown? Uh, yes, thank you, Henry. That, that's actually a very good point. Uh, I'm mean, going to have a good vantage point here um, from the capital maritime perspective and uh, looking at the different sectors and how they reacted to COVID. Um, and I think the most acute uh, reaction so far has definitely been on the container side. Um, I think uh, effectively this is COVID-19 is right now in the driver's seat uh, as far as the container ship sector um, and uh, the market out outlook is actually quite quite challenging. Uh, if you think about it, uh, world economy impact, consumer activity, supply, supply chains, uh, they all came under significant pressure uh, and uh, this resulted in a sharp contraction in global container trade uh, which is expected to last until at least this quarter. Um, estimates for the year, uh, they talk about a contraction of excess uh, 10% uh, in, in terms of demand for TEU um, uh, 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 miles, um, which is effectively a steeper decline than what you saw in 2009 for Sleeman, which was closer to 9%. Uh, and in addition to that, you have a lot of uncertainty uh, with regard to lockdowns, uh, how quickly uh, we will uh, go back to more normalized trade patterns, uh, will there be um, uh, more virus outbreaks in the future. So this uh, definitely does not help. Uh, the, uh, the liners uh, were very quick to react to this new reality um, and we have seen uh, substantial uh, blind sailings. Effectively, they have uh, reduced uh, capacity to the extent that they could and uh, of course the first uh, uh, vessels that they, uh, that, uh, they could um, um, re-deliver where they wanted were coming off charter so to Trump owners uh, like us and as a result uh, the charter market has suffered. Um, when you look at the various um, uh, segments uh, you have seen um, a reduction in day rates uh, anywhere between 50 to 70 percent um, but having said that, um, and while it has been um, the common wisdom has been that uh, demand uh, will, um, uh, will come back or rebound more in 2021, we have seen uh, over the last few weeks really the first uh, signs of recovery. And I'm not really talking about um, a substantial increase in day rates, but we have seen more increased activity, at least in certain segments of the market, like the one we are active in, which is the, the Neo-Panamax or the, or the post-Panamax uh, uh, segment. Um, so I think if you are in the right segment right now, now and you have staying power, uh, you don't need uh, to, to fix uh, long-term, and you have the right kind of ships, for example, 
our exposure in the short medium term is only 9,000 BU eco-wide beam vessels with high liquor intake. Um, I, I think that uh, the, uh, the cost uh, will be relatively small, always assuming that we will see uh, things going back to normality uh, over in Q3 and Q4. And that's a big gift because uh, I think we have seen how quickly uh, the uh, COVID-19 can spread again, even in places where it has been uh, previously reported as eliminated. Uh, but um, uh, it is, uh, but I, I, I'm at least encouraged to see more activity in the charter, charter market over the last few weeks, for sure. I think this is, this is a good sign. Thank you. Yeah, Gary, could you, could you do the honours and give us a little uh, overview of where we are on dry bulk or where, and how we got here? Obviously, things are starting to pick up at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's pretty dynamic, uh, has, been, has been thus far. And, and uh, you know, in particular this week, we've seen the, the Cape market uh, go up dramatically, uh, now over 19,000 on the index today. Uh, so, so and, and, and another positive is that the futures are also, you know, trending up pretty significantly. Uh, on the Cape market, which we're not in, you know, 18,000 for Q3. So significantly different than the 2000 lows that we saw uh, not too far ago. You know, if I go back and look, you know, the dry bulk market, um, you know, dropped in, in early part of the year with the outbreak in China, but our markets in the midsize actually recovered back to where they started the year around 8,000. Not a great market, but had recovered post Chinese, the extended lunar, you know, Chinese holiday, uh, if you will. And then it really was on the lockdown of the rest of the world that we saw demand just fall away. So we had cargo supply shock where mines were shut down, and then we had demand shock as well. So I, I really would bifurcate this into two things. One is as the world is opening up, we're starting to see, you know, kind of a restocking as you would expect. And, and, and then the other question is what happens? What does the recovery look like? You know, are we just going to have a restocking to a low, lower growth, or we think a very good possibility is, is that stimulus. Uh, Nomura came out and said that infrastructure spend in China um, in May was up 10% year over year, and it was 4.8% in April. So clearly the trend is, as it's not just opening up, but the stimulus is coming. And in Washington yesterday, we heard a trillion dollar stimulus uh, number. You know, a year ago, you say trillion dollars and people would, you know, kind of shake and say that won't happen. But in the context of stimulus these days, you know, a trillion dollars um, is just a little bit more uh, than what's been done. So, so you know, we do think that there's a very strong, part, you know, uh, chance that globally we're going to see, you know, uh, governments step in, and obviously that's good for dry bulk. You know, at the moment, the the markets that are most affected, things like, you know, steel, cement, are are around infrastructure and, and build. So you could see those go the go the other way quickly. I would say the one bright spot, aside from you know iron ore, which again we don't really participate in that market, but but you know stockpiles are quite low, and we're seeing you know as I talked about that restocking, you know the the one really bright spot and and the one is is the soybean market and and grain, you know because China has repopulated the the pig population after the uh, Asian swine flu last year and, and expected that to be up you know, around five to 6% this year. It can't do it on its own, but that's definitely been a strong bright spot and, and we're starting to see the others participate as well. Okay. Um, Kevin, would you, would you like to just give us a little, uh, little rundown of where we are in tankers? Tankers obviously rather an extraordinary performer during this whole process, bucking all the trends. Uh, how long does that last or has it already done its, done its job? Yeah, I think it's, <clears throat> for tankers, it's, it's been a, a fantastic, you know, nine months really. Um, if you go back to late September of last year, um, you know, fundamentals were setting up for a pretty good 2020, both from an oil supply standpoint and a, a tanker demand. Um, but nobody could have foreseen the fact we were going to have not one, not two, but actually three black swan events uh, that in each case poured gasoline on a market that was already going to be a strong one. So we had the, the, uh, the Costco sanctions situation in October that led us into a really good winter. Um, we started off uh, 2020 with an oil price war between the Saudis and the, um, the Russians, which put an awful lot of oil you know, on the water for us to move. 
Um, and then obviously COVID has, has had a huge impact. So it's been a, a fantastic run. And I think Lois would probably agree with me. It's, uh, it's been a good uh, cash generator. And I think a lot of the tanker companies in this space have, have been able to really address their, their capital structures and, and build strength in their balance sheets. It's certainly something that, that we have in TK have taken advantage of and, and done a damn good job of, of putting the company in a much stronger position. Um, you know, specific to COVID, I think the tanker industry is sort of the, the flip side of the coin from just about any other industry that's out there, be it, you know, containers, bulk carriers or, or, or tech. Um, COVID for us really has driven... Um, a front, a front half windfall that we are now, as the, the rest of the world economy starts to come out of and starts to recover, we're going to face some headwinds. Um, as COVID uh, basically extracted 25 million barrels a day of oil demand at the same time as the Russians and the Saudis were increasing production, um, that has led to um, obviously strong markets, but an inventory build both onshore and offshore. And as demand starts to recover, which we're already starting to see, um, I think it might take some time for us to, to whittle down that, that floating storage, I think, initially and, and the on -store, onshore storage uh, laterally. So as we look towards what the, the second half of this year and, and 21 might look like, um, you know, I think obviously they're not going to be as good in the market as what we've seen over the last nine months. Um, but it's uncertain. And I think at this point, it's, it's a little bit too early to, to judge, you know, how weak and for how long this market uh, develops. We've seen floating storage in, in past years, 2009, 10, 2015, 16. Uh, floating storage didn't go away overnight. So if we repeat that sort of scenario, we, we have an opportunity to, to keep tanker supply at bay. Um, but we have to be realistic. There's currently almost 10 million barrels a day of production cut. Um, so there's less oil in the water to be moved. So I think we've got some, some pretty strong headwinds near term. How that looks as we get further out and into 21, um, I think the jury's still out whether we see sustained recovery early on or whether we've got to go through more of the year before that demand resurgence that we're seeing in the, in the real economy actually translate into uh, oil tanker demand transfer, transportation. And, and Lois, um, the other side of, of this story is the, is the operational side, the, the, the human side, if you like, of, of COVID with uh, you know, crew transfers and so on. How, how has your experience been with that? How are the, how are the crew holding up? You know, uh, at Seaways, we've been working very closely with Z Group. And we've added programs, you know, for mental health for the seafarers. Uh, we're actually, uh, you know, working on a scheme to uh, reward some of the seafarers that are, are overdoing their contracts. So one of our, our KPIs is really to try to keep those contracts where uh, the guys are relieved on time. So we went into the crisis where they were being we, with a very good track record. But now uh, it's, it is a, a definite challenge to uh, repatriate your crews to there, there are not uh, the international flights nor the freedom of movement in, in many of these countries. So it's really a, a big issue, but wherever we can, uh, on one of our VLCCs, we were going by and we, we were able to pull into an Indian port and affect a uh, crew transfer. You know, it's, a little bit ad hoc because systematically it is very difficult uh, to repatriate the crews. But we, we also uh, pride ourselves on uh, top management and all of our operations staff getting out to sea over you know 30 of our ships a year. And clearly that's not something that we're able to do it now either. So we're replacing that with uh, more frequent vessel, you know, phone calls with the captain, making sure that the crews are uh, staying motivated and resilient at this time. But it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely a challenge. And I, 
you know, we're taking every opportunity that we can because we don't know whether or not there will be, uh, when will that lifting come and make it easier for our seafarers to transit to their homeland? And, uh, you know, will there be more restrictions put in place as we see hot spots pop up around the world? And Bing, is this, is this on the container side, is this a major headache for you as well? Uh, on our side, actually, uh, it, there's a certain inconveniences, but so far uh, we actually manage quite well. Uh, we actually operate and manage out of this 123 vessels, we manage about 110. As Louise just said, uh, there are certain restrictions. We have actually uh, managed to change the crews uh, successfully uh, actually out of Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a place actually uh, it allows for the cruise changes. Uh, as I was just actually uh, talking to my chief operating officer this morning, uh, we have, uh, you know, over five to eight percent of crew has been on a regular changes. The other crews is actually, you know, some of them staying longer than they want it to be. But um, I, I think in general, uh, it is not convenient, but it's manageable so far. The question is how long that's going to last. Um, uh, you know, if, if and I think right now there's some other parts, um, the U.S. West Coast, and also I think Turkey start to opening. Um, so in terms of restrictions, so hopefully, as the rest of the world start to um, uh, gradually lifting these restrictions, then they will also have. Um, you know, more uh, more uh, convenient uh, opportunities for the crews to change. So so far, I think it's, it's manageable. Okay, okay. And just staying with you, Bing, for one for one second. Uh, I'm interested to know from your perspective, has your longer term outlook changed at all in the last three or four months? Has anything changed in terms of an acceleration of trends towards localization or towards fear of extended? logistics chains or uh, a lack of cooperation between countries that makes you slightly more concerned about the market? Yeah, at overall, the longer term, uh, we still believe that uh, it's, it's positive. In other words, that uh, um, from a container shipping state space, uh, we believe the long-term perspective remains the same. Now, it is true if you're looking at uh, currently, there's a lot of the noises in terms of uh, localization or de-globalization. But if you're looking at container space over the, you know, started and it really started in the 80s and over the past 20 years, the container shipping the industry or the volume has grown with the CAGR of uh, more than 7% over the past 20 years consistently. So you, you can see that the base today is much, much significant than it used to be 20 years ago. Is that going to be continue to grow in the same pace? The answer is no. But, you know, container today, and I think if you're looking at from an industry standpoint, first of all, this is still is a major transportation means to, you know, to, to the global transportation. Secondly, if you're looking at from the uh, so-called the localization, I mean, localization, it could happen, and I think it will happen, but that magnitude of the localization is, as you all know, it's a logistics business. Logistics business requires a whole community, requires the time, requires the, 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 the investments. Ultimately, it's a cost game. So, I mean, I, from, from a, this, is a macro, this is an economic issue, but I think, uh, you know, it will have changes in terms of the uh, the patterns, in other words, that you know, certain factory will be moving from one country to the other. But for the container business, I think ultimately you're in the logistics business. So the trading pattern is going to change instead of from China to US, now China to Vietnam, Vietnam to the US. Actually, potentially, you will create some regional. Uh, you, you know, activities increase and certain routes that you will be, you know, in other words, the pattern will change. Then you're looking at from an industry standpoint, um, I think the industry is much more sustainable than it used to be. Uh, just looking at this time around, I, I think, uh, you know, liners is much more stronger than it used to be because they consolidated over the past two or three years. And if you're looking at today, you know, look, the freight rates, actually, it's higher than last year. The uh, charter rates, 
meaning that the, the vessel charter rates actually dropped quite significantly. The fuel price came down. The, the, the liners, alliance, you know, within the liners, alliance actually cut a lot of, uh, you know, sellings. So their loadability, actually I spoke to one of the liners, their loadability actually, you know, for per vessel, they just achieved record high. So you have a high loadability, you have a lower charter rate, you have a lower fuel cost, you cut your blank sellings, and, and, um, and I think the line is actually working very well, so their financially actually is pretty good. If you're looking at it from the volume perspective, uh, this year, I think the first quarter on a year-over-year -year basis, uh, it, it, the, 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 the volume declined by the single digits. The second quarter, I think it's gonna be somewhere around 15%, reduction the third quarter is is projected to be about you know five percent and the fourth quarter is probably started getting back to normal so if you're looking at you know the 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 the, um, uh, the volume development looking at the looking at the health of the liners and also you're looking at the general demand and supply i mean the supply side uh, the new build for sure, still at the record low on the supply side I think uh, you know today the impact most are the smaller vessels. Uh, they're just speaking for I think the general in the market that what we observed. Uh, uh, so therefore, I think the industry actually uh, this time around, uh, from all aspects, whether it's liners um, and also from the from the tonnage provider side, I think this time around will be having impact. It, it does have a much higher you know idle idle vessels. Uh, and the rate is actually coming down. And so the, in, the, in the space of the owner operator space, I think this time around is actually, uh, it's gonna have some impact for those ones that purely only providing the vessel as a commodity instead of a providing a solution. The, those ones that would not necessarily, necessarily have the scales um, and the flexibility, those are the ones that's gonna be impacted. Thank you. Um Let's change tack very slightly here. Obviously, it's still all part of the same theme um, of you know, an acceleration, perhaps, of global trends. But moving on to ship finance. Um, to, so we've had problems of ship finance or sourcing of ship finance for a fair while now. Um, more recently, certainly in the last three months, we've seen uh, an acceleration for where I'm sitting of moves towards shunning uh, anything that's carbon intensive. Um, I'm just wondering from your perspective, and perhaps Jerry would be an interesting person to start with you. Um, are you. Are you seeing any shift now in the sources of financing for fleet renewal or future investment? I, I think there are two uh, different factors at play here. Um, as you said, over the last uh, um, uh, few quarters, we have seen increasingly a much livelier discussion um, around uh, emissions, around uh, so-called uh, green banking, uh, as well as um, uh, how, how uh, the different financial sources uh, will allocate capital in the future, uh, uh, given uh, some of those concerns. Um, it uh, started with the Poseidon principles. Uh, I think we have seen uh, quite a few financial institutions, mostly Western, uh, commercial banks um, um, endorse uh, the Poseidon principles. But uh, overall, I think uh, the move is uh, very clear uh, also in the public markets, uh, be it um, equity investors or bond investors, uh, they have been starting to, to look um, uh, at that uh, side of the business as well. Um, but uh, all that, uh, I think, I think uh, under normal circumstances would mostly differentiate uh, the owners uh, that um, are uh, larger owners with a larger footprint who have their resources uh, to modernize their fleet, who have fleet in the water, uh, and uh, they are able to look at uh, new technologies. So again, uh, this, uh, if you want, two-tier market that we had in the past uh, with uh, larger companies uh, having more access than uh, medium to smaller ones, I think that uh, uh, that gap is opening up even more. 
Um, but at the same time, I think there is also a COVID-19 impact. It, it remains to be seen uh, how acute this is going to be. Uh, for sure, at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, we have seen uh, uh, people um, react cautiously, and I think that's a normal uh, uh, reaction. Uh, many banks uh, were concerned uh, about their balance sheets uh, and what potential NPLs, uh, uh, how potential NPLs would impact uh, those balance sheets, and if that, uh, that is on the wider economy, right? And if that would uh, um, impact the availability of uh, financing uh, to, among others, uh, shipping. Uh, and that's, of course, uh, to be seen in the context of uh, shipping markets, probably with the exception of tankers that were also suffering from COVID. So I think we have seen many financiers take a step back or think uh, uh, more about what uh, the COVID-19 impact would be on their own balance sheet as well as on their customers. It does seem to me uh, that given the stimuli, stimuli package uh, that uh, have been put in place, including uh, substantial monetary easing, uh, some of that uh, adverse impact uh, will be mitigated as there will be, um, uh, there is a lot of uh, additional liquidity, very cheap money that uh, financial institutions will have access to. So I think uh, it remains to be seen uh, what uh, the uh, impact of COVID-19 will be on uh, financing. Um, it is clear that uh, uh, people are more cautious at this point, uh, but I'm not convinced that, that in the long term we will see a substantial uh, uh, change uh, in the landscape. However, the uh, concerns about uh, emissions and uh, green shipping uh, will definitely uh, be in play going forward. And as a general uh, point, I do think that they will uh, benefit uh, larger companies with uh, uh, more resources. And Hing, in, uh, in Asia, would you share that view? I mean, there's always been, a, well, certainly in the last sort of five, 10 years, a sort of almost an east-west divide on sources of financing, China, China pushing you know, very strongly ahead into the sector. Is that pretty much open to everybody now? Is that, a, is that going to become the dominant source of financing, you think, for ship owners going forward? Certainly from our position in Hong Kong, um, financing has significantly diversified over the last 10 years. Um, 10 years ago, the so-called financial leasing companies in China were really just starting out. I think Hong Kong were among the first to tap into lease finance in shipping. Um, as it's witnessed globally over the four to five years, um, the appetite of Chinese financial companies have um, exploded um, significantly to the extent that they're no, not only providing financing to shipping companies, but some of them are acting de facto as ship owners. So in Hong Kong, we're in a relatively fortunate position where on the one hand, as a very well-established financial market, we can tap into traditional European-based um, uh, financial institution for traditional shipping loans, etc. But at the same time, we're also extremely well placed to tap into the new type of money that's coming out of China in the form of uh, ship lease financing. Um, I think Hong Kong's position has actually grown um, in recent times. Um, over the last two to three years, um, Hong Kong shipping industry has been pushing very hard for Hong Kong government to make Hong Kong as uh, a better place for financial institutions, particularly um, who actively engage in ship finance to set up offices in Hong Kong. And I'm very pleased to tell you that as of about a week ago, um, the official bill for ship finance has been passed in Hong Kong. So we're actually expecting to see um, greater access to uh, ship financing in, in, in the form of uh, leasing finance in Hong Kong in, in the coming future. From our perspective, I think um, tap into the financing, traditional finance, people will become a lot more conservative because of general sentiment in the market, because of COVID-19. I can't think of any banks that have not been affected in one way or the other. But I think reputation will go a long way. And this is where I'd like to differ a little bit from Jerry. I think in addition to the scale of the operation, the size of the company, reputation actually goes a long way. And we have had private conversations with certain banks that they are not looking to invest in shipping companies of 
necessarily tremendous size, but shipping companies with long-term commitment who are not playing around with people's money, but who have long-term commitment in the industry and who are spending the money on expanding, growing the fleet, managing assets in a reasonable and sensible way. Thanks, Hing. Uh, Gary, is being a public company still one of the best ways of raising finance? You know, clear, clearly access to capital is, is, is one of the important aspects. I mean, where share prices trade today, broadly speaking, in, in the, uh, across the sector is, is a challenge to accessing that capital on the equity side. So, so yeah, I think, I think it is. And, and um, we've been able to, uh, to grow the business and renew the fleet um, accessing the capital markets. But as I said, you know, the share price, uh, the challenges on, on, you know, call it price to nav and is, is definitely a hindrance to do that. So, so at the moment, um, you know, a lot of the, the benefits of it are, aren't available. Um, at least we don't think in a, in a, a creative or a positive way. Um, but, but I think that's, you know, I think we're also in a very unique time frame right now. So as, as things, you know, unwind or, or, or normalize, uh, we think, you know, we're going to see uh, di different, you know, developments on the price side. If I could just carry on on the, the supply side of things on the dry bulk, uh, you know, sim in some ways similar maybe to, to container, but we're now at, uh, you know, an 18 year low from a supply side of the order book for dry bulk and actually the lowest it's ever been in the mid-size segment since they started keeping track back in the mid 90s. We're at 6% order book, uh, and, and, and there's a lot of headwinds aside from, you know, I think talked about the, uh, the, the, the challenges of, of, of banks pulling back, but there's a lot of other reasons, you know, propulsion question marks in terms of emissions, um, balance sheet challenges as well, um, a, a general pullback mm -hmm. from, from, you know, lending in what is a very fragmented part of the industry. So we're quite optimistic that although right now the focus is all about COVID-19 and demand contraction and what does that recovery look like, I think the real story in dry bulk is, is the supply side. And for the first time in a long time, I'm optimistic that we can keep those numbers down. I mean, if you look the last three years, you know, dry bulk's ordered an average of 400 ships since the low market of 2016. You know, why? We don't need more dry bulk ships. And, and, and there's a lot of reasons why people have done so. Um, but I do think now, in aggregate, the hurdles or the headwinds to, to ordering are, are piling up in such a, such a state that, you know, I'm not naive to think we won't have any ordering, but I think we can keep it at such a state that when demand comes back, that combination of the two can be quite powerful. Yeah, that's a good point. Lois, to what it, you know, when you're thinking about the um, fleet renewal, new building market, you know, to what extent? <laughs> Are those issues that Gary mentions in your mind? I mean, particularly the engine design has been a lot of debate, you know, in the last few weeks about, you know, decarbonization, 2050, 2030, a new building is probably going to be touching on some of those dates, certainly 2030. Is that one of the reasons that, uh, that you're not seeing ordering? Because you've got the same deficit of orders on tankers as you, as you have on dry, I guess. Yeah, I, I think uh, from Gary's numbers, we're probably not quite as excellent as he is, but we, we, we are uh, probably at the lowest numbers that we've been in, in about 20 years across most of the tanker space. We're in single digits for, for the new building order book. Uh, with, without a doubt, uh, the propulsion issues, you know, is, is it going to be ammonia? Is it going to be dual fuel? You know, is that going to pay? Uh, it's, it's a big piece of the price ticket for uh, any of us, you know, you're trying to build an asset for in, in a 25 year life and the technology is changing very rapidly and the demands on all of us are, are extremely high, you know, uh, as we look to reduce all of our emissions. So I think it's a really big factor in the market. And I also think the extreme volatility that we're seeing um, in some of our sectors influences things as well. But as a ship owner, uh, you know, we want to be careful on those investments so that, you know, being a, a first mover on technology that then proves to be quickly irrelevant is not what any of us look to achieve. So uh, I think it's definitely a factor and, and it's playing, you know, well into hopefully a uh, nice recovery uh, across the, the space in shipping. And I do think that, um, 
you know, we've been very, everybody is very impacted by, uh, by COVID. I don't think there's been anything uh, in modern times that has had such an impact on worldwide demand. I don't think we've ever had 4 billion people sheltering in place. And now, you know, you're starting to see, uh, we're starting to see that demand rebound and, and we'll see how that plays out. But I definitely, I definitely believe that technology has a big influence on that order book. So if you were to place an order today, you'd be going for a conventional asset or would you be looking at one of these dual fuel or? Uh... I would not place an order today. And, and uh, I mean, uh, that's pretty much what Gary's saying as well, isn't it? That there's a lot yeah. of resistance now to placing orders. On containers, I suppose, being is slightly different, isn't it? Containers have adopted, embraced dual fuel. Is, 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 that, a, is that more a, a function of the size of the, of the fleets, that they feel more responsibility to, to take an active role in this decarbonisation process? Uh, whereas other smaller sectors, perhaps, feel that they're waiting for the regulation or they're waiting for the technology to come along to provide the solution? Yeah, for the container side, um, I think that today there are probably half and half uh, because you know, this is primarily driven uh, by the liners themselves. Uh, for example, we will never place an order unless there is a, you know, a need from the liners. So the current status is that if looking at LNG, um, I, I think uh, probably uh, half of the participants is looking at LNG. The other half of it is still looking at the traditional proportion uh, as, as, a, as, a, as the new build. So it's not that clear yet in terms of, it's not a clear cut in terms of, you know, that's the only way to go. Um, and for reasons, it's, again, the technology, there's pros and cons from, a, from an economic standpoint you know, the price differentiation has to be able to justify it. That's one mm -hmm. thing. Then also from a technology standpoint today, um, you know, from, a, you know, the bigger size of the, the vessels um, probably is more justified to have the LNG similar to scrubber in a way. You know, I, I guess you haven't asked the question with the scrubber. Um, I think a scrubber today, as is today, if those, the younger vessels, uh, the larger vessels, They've been fitted with the scrubber, even given, you know, the, the current uh, fuel price is still, it just, the return of the investment period is longer. You know, it used to be maybe before was like it's three years, two years versus now four or five years. So, you know, I think the, the technology or the regulatory or environmental, uh, this is definitely is going to be, uh, you know, the, the, the direction or of the trend going forward. But um, I think there are technology and also economic considerations that needs to be balanced in considering which technology or which proportion system you're going to use. Okay. Now, you mentioned the word scrubbers there. We, we couldn't uh, leave this uh, session without at least uh, discussing it. Uh, we've got quite an interesting mix. I think I looked earlier, we've got uh, a couple of you haven't really adopted scrubbers at all. One of you used Garmin. Uh, pretty much 100 percent. I think we've got the majority of you are scrubber adopters. Gary, you're you're probably the most vocal proponent of scrubbers. Uh, are you holding your head high in front of investors now and saying it was a good idea? Well, I, I absolutely think it was a good idea. Um, and the thesis, you know, if we look at January, fuel spreads went to 350, and and to, you know, were able to lock in on the forward curve. $290 a ton. And we started a, a pretty significant hedge position um, and, and locked in 25% of our um, fuel spreads for 2020 and 2021. And we, we disclosed in our last um, earnings call, it had a 10 million mark to market, unfortunately, because of the collapse. So I think we got most of, almost all of it right. Um, we didn't uh, bank on a global pandemic. Um, so, you know, but, but, you know, at this stage, you know, the fuel spread of 70 still generates around $15 million of, of unlevered cash flow on for us what's an $85 million investment. And that's on top of those spreads, those hedges I mentioned that, that we could can monetize given the collapse. So so yes, the answer is we're we're comfortable with it. I understand why companies are pushing off CapEx at the moment because of it, but I'm very glad that we got ours, you know, done in time for for the start and, and the wide field spreads that that came. And you know, Bing's absolutely right. The, the, the payback period is longer than 
how it would have been in a $300 fuel environment. That would have been amazing, but, but we still feel it is. It, it's a good, good uh, cash flow, especially in a weak market. If you look at where the dry bulk market has been, the one bright spot has been the cash flow uh, generated uh, on, on that investment. And we think as fuel prices, um, you know, as oil prices uh, normalize, but also as competition for uh, mid distillates, right? When, as aviation comes back, you'll st- I, we th- think you'll start to see those fuel spreads widen uh, significantly as well. But even, in, as I said, even in today's market, it's meaningful cash flow for a company like ours. And Lois, your experience is a little bit more nuanced on uh, mm-hmm. ovens. How would you describe that? Yes, so we, we have uh, installed uh, seven of the 10 uh, scrubbers on our modern VLCCs. The three that we pushed off, we elected to align them with their natural 2021 dry docking dates. But it, it was interesting, you know, definitely um, in February when uh, it really hit China, the COVID obviously first, and that was a challenge when we were trying to get the installations done in the yards in China, it was not free movement of labor, we didn't have adequate people in there, but we uh, powered through it. And I, I think China, um, open back up uh, in their yards uh, fairly quickly. And the interesting thing is that, <laughs> so, you know, in order for you to capture, you know, the really strong rates on some of those BLCCs, you had to have a, a prompt solid position uh, wh- where your ship was cargo free. And I, I think on some of those uh, scrubber installations, we were right in the right window in the right place to be able to roll in and grab some of those uh, very high time charter commitment. So, you know, uh, o- overall, uh, to Gary's point, I mean, right now you're probably about four grand a day differential on uh, on a VLCC on your, on your average consumption for a year. Uh, I do believe that uh, oil prices will rebound strongly, not necessarily immediately, but because you've had such CapEx reductions from major oil companies and national oil companies, uh, and even the U.S. Uh, shale patch, I, I think that there's a potential for oil prices to be well stronger than where they are today in uh, second half 2021 and the beginning of 2022. And when you see those prices rise, you also see the different differentials widen. And I think overall that will have proved to have been a wise decision. Kevin, who, who TK has not done scrubbers, um, will, will you change your mind or is that pretty much a, a, a set position? Um, well, you know, yeah, we made the decision not to, not to install and um, I would love to take credit for, for being able to predict where spreads are today, but uh, no, we're, we weren't that smart. You know, like probably every company, we, we looked at this holistically. Um, you know, we, it didn't sit with us to continue burning heavy sulfur fuel when one of our core values is sustainability. Um, so we opted for the, the lower uh, sulfur fuel option. Um, the other, the, the big element that we really looked at was if to take on more debt, um, do we understand the risk that we're taking? And we landed on the fact that we don't know what the oil price is going to do. Um, we're, we're tanker men uh, and women, and that's, that's what we know. We, don't, we, we shouldn't speculate on oil price um, at the expense of, of levering up to do it. Um, so, you know, those are the, the two main elements around why we chose not to. Um, I'm pleased with the way it's turned out. I mean, we had, you know, the vast majority of our fleet that wasn't on, uh, on TC out in the spot market through the Costco crisis, the winter peak, mm. the trade war, the COVID situation in China. We were, every ship in the fleet was milking the market and driving that cash generation towards paying down debt. And, you know, we generated over, you know, $300 million of, of free cash flow and paid down 30% of our, our debt. So, I'm pleased with the decision we've made, but I think realistically, we internally have always said to our board, we're really, whether it was the right decision or the wrong decision, I don't think you can look at in a short term window. You think you've got to look at it over the next couple of years. 
um, because we don't know where spreads are going to be. You've heard views on the, on the panel that we're going to have a strong recovery in oil prices. I sit here today and I, I can't guarantee that to, to our shareholders and, and our employees. So, um, I, you know, our, our view is it's been good so far. Uh, we think it will continue for the rest of this year and maybe well into next year. Um, so let's take advantage of that and um, we'll see what happens down the road. Um, but it's, I think it's too early to judge whether these decisions were, were good or bad. Great. We have two minutes left. Um, I, I just want to open a sort of a broad question out. Um, although uh, being a, uh, uh, um, an internet uh, process, I've got to identify an individual to answer it first. So perhaps, Hing, would you be so kind as to answer this one? Ship owning generally, do, do you think it's still a speculative game, it's still a capital intensive business, or is it evolving? I mean, you're, you're a young man in, coming into this industry. How do, how, do you, how do you see the business now? I think the shipping industry is evolving much more rapidly than it ever has since modern shipping came into being in many ways. Digitization, question about propulsion, environmental regulations, the fact that, you know, seafarers we have today, are they fit for purpose 10 years down the road when ships could look quite different? and using fuel that simply do not exist in the market today. So th with all of these things coming to uh, shipping, I think uh, volatility, geopolitical uncertainties, and all of that's happening right now. However, as a ship owner, I think it's in our blood, if you like, to adapt to changing global political economic circumstances. That's been the name of the game since day one. And as an independent ship owner, what I have found very challenging, but also very rewarding, is actually constantly trying to reposition yourself in relation to the market. I mean, for example, the rise of the financial leasing companies in China, as is well known to some people in the industry, certainly to Kevin, Wagong has taken the opportunity, rather than seeing that as a challenge, to the position of ship owners, we see them as strategic partners so that we can provide them with um, management and operational and commercial solutions uh, to grow together. So in that sense, I think, you know, shipping remains challenging, but interesting. And I think they, there will be a lot of opportunities uh, coming even when the headwind is strongest. I mean, um, also Gary and I think some of the other panelists um, pointed out to the fact that changes that are going to come in the dry bulk sector, in the tanker sector, certainly in VLCC, um, is the transportation of crude oil going to be uh, as important a factor in global train transportation in 10 years' time, in 15 years' time? The answer to that is probably no, but because of the uncertainty, a lot of traditional owners are very hesitant of going to the market and therefore the opportunity that could come with 20%, 25% of uh, VLCC going to be scrapped um, over the next three to four years, there is going to be a window of opportunity for people who combine caution with opportunism, I think. Jerry, what hat are you going to be wearing this time next year then? Are you going to still be back in containers or are you going to be, what, what's, your, what's your punt for the sector to pull uh, with most upside? Um, I guess that's, um, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, I, I think the opportunity, let me, let me reply this uh, in a more general uh, way. I think the opportunity uh, potentially lies uh, in um, uh, price development going forward. The fact that uh, as uh, other panelists have highlighted that we see very little new ordering because of uh, uncertainty, uh, the fact that uh, we have a little liquidity in the S&P market uh, will, uh, will create opportunities, uh, be it in the tanker market, uh, potential on the dry side, as well as on the container, uh, or even on the LNG side, where we also have seen some interesting opportunities. So I think that the deflation that we are seeing in asset prices because of COVID, because of the uncertainty around uh, um, uh, technology and propulsion, 
uh, will create opportunities for those not, on, not only that have the financial resources, but also the sophistication uh, to, to understand it. I think that's the differentiating factor going forward. In the past, you could take a punt if there was a low dividend price. Today, uh, if you want to take a punt, you have to understand propulsion. You have to understand what dual fuel means. Uh, and uh, I think the, uh, the outfits that have this type of sophistication in-house and can take uh, informed wagers are much fewer than they were in the past. Wonderful. Okay, I think we've come to the end of our end of our slot. Um, so just to say, uh, I found that a very interesting chat. I'm sure other people have too. So thank you very much, uh, Bing, Hing, Kevin, Lois, Jerry, Gary. Thank you for your time. Uh, it's been uh, it's been great fun. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.